I don't see anybody to let in. Okay, and I'm still looking for your bio, so. Uh, attendees are two people, participants are five. There's Amy Yellen, there's Ken Fassman, and there's Margaret O'Donohue. Um, could okay, there, I've got, your, I've got your bio, wonderful, okay. Okay, we are having some technical difficulties. Good evening, everyone. I'm Judy Bolton Fassman, and this is the fabulous, wonderful Jessica Keener, my conversation partner for the evening. Um, Hi, everybody. If you could just indicate in the chat that you're seeing us, because the inmates are kind of running the asylum. <laughs> Pun intended. Which is just a perfect, isn't it? A perfect. perfect. Little... It's perfect. The yes, it is. Intended. So if you could just tell us that you're seeing us. Oh. He said we can see, he can see and hear okay, us. Great. That is my. Wonderful. Wonderful. Amy Yellen. Hello. And Ken. Hello, Ken. Yep. That's, that's my better half. All right. Let's do this, Jessica. All we, right. We're just sort of, um, we didn't practice for this. There's some, you know, technical difficulties, but we're going to, we're going to do the best we can here. I have the honor of introducing Jessica Keener. I'm a, a huge fan, um, and she has, I, I will say this before I formally introduce her, she has been so supportive of me throughout the years um, and so kind, and I'm so delighted to be be with you here, Jessica. So Jessica- That's nice of you. No, it's, it's true. Jessica's official bio goes like this. Jessica is the author of the national best-selling debut novel, Night Swim, a collection of award-winning stories Women in Bed, and the novel Strangers in Budapest, which was a 2017 and 2018 Indie Next pick, a best new novel by Entertainment Weekly, and landed on the Southern Independent bestseller list. Her essay, The Flow Room, was included in the anthology Alone, Together, Love, Grief, and Comfort in the Time of COVID-19, which recently won the Washington Book Prize 2021 in nonfiction. She is completing a new novel set in Boston, and she's, and I'm so grateful you're here tonight, Jessica. Well, I'm grateful that you wanted to talk to me. Um, I have a wonderful memory of attending your uh, book club. That's how we met, somehow, mm -hmm. and this was for my first novel, so that was thrilling. And you drove me home, and I, mm -hmm. I want to share this with our listeners. Um, and we sat in the car for a bit on, in the street. It was at night. We sat in the car in the dark and you were telling me about this memoir you were writing and, um, you know, tr struggling with it, but determined. And I don't know how many years ago that was now, but I can relate because, you know, it took me whatever, 17 years to write Night Swim, get it together, get it published. It was a very long, long time. So I'm so thrilled that your book, Asylum, is finally out. Um, and I've just read it and it's fascinating and there's a lot of depth, it's emotional, I have questions. Um, so I'm gonna give you your bio first and then we'll get into some talk. So, um, so Judy Bolton Fassman is the author of Asylum, her debut a memoir of family secrets from Mandel Villar Press. Am I saying that correctly? Mm -hmm. Mandel Villar Press, yep, perfect. Okay, her essays and reviews have appeared in major newspapers, essay anthologies, and literary magazines. She's a recipient of numerous writing fellowships, a four-time winner of the Rock Hour Award from the American Jewish Press Association and a Pushcart Prize nominee. Judy is the arts and cultural writer for jewishboston.com, which is a great site too. Um, wonderful, okay. So tonight, I think I wanna just dive into why uh, we, I'm gonna say we are obsessed with family secrets because this book is about family secrets mm -hmm. um, and you are the daughter of two fascinating parents, very different personalities, different coming from different cultures. Um, and from the earliest age, you kind of had some kind of, I don't know if it was discomfort, nagging feeling. Um, I, don't, I, I want you to describe it to me. What was it that just drove you to begin so early with this kind of sleuthing personality that you describe at the beginning of the book? 
Yeah, I was gonna. I was actually gonna um, get into to mention that um, my persona when I was little was, and everybody has a role in the family was that I was nosy, and I was curious. Let let, let let's be i be a little more po polite about it. I was curious, and it kind of drove my parents crazy. But um, you know, I I felt like I came by it honestly, even when I was six years old, because. I had discovered that there were a series of books, of mystery books, with a girl detective named Judy Bolton. And I remember seeing my first Judy Bolton book in my older cousin's house and then seeing it in my school library. And I could not have been more thrilled to see my name on the spine of a book. It was fantastic. That is amazing. <laughs> so, and my parents, I mean, I, I don't want to give too much away. I, I would love people to discover this, you know, as they read the book, but my parents were very different people. My father was uh, almost 17 years older than my mother. Uh, he was an uh, American born, uh, American educated at Yale University. He was a naval officer in the Second World War. When he entered the Navy, just to give you some perspective, my mother was five years old. And she was living in Cuba and she was coming fresh off the experience of remembering or her family remembering the St. Louis, the being docked in Havana Harbor with, I guess, over 900 um, German Jewish refugees who were not allowed to get off the boat. Oh, okay. So um, that was, you know, so that's, that's where her that's what she was doing when he was going into the Navy. So there, you know, that, that gap between them was almost like fertile territory for sleuthing. I was just so curious about them. My mother was so glamorous, could be so glamorous and so depressed. She had these extremes and my father was just, you know, he was kind of this stern, aloof figure in my childhood. It changed later, later on, he was, um, we had a much um, uh, deeper relationship and a much warmer relationship. But when I was a kid, he was like strict and, you know, pounding on the door, screaming, Navy shower, Navy shower, don't use too much water kind of thing. So they were very different people. And I feel that their differences sparked my curiosity. I wonder too if all the sleuth thing was a way of trying to control an environment that often felt out of control. I don't know. I'm I, I'm throwing I'm, I'm that sure out that there. That was part of it. I mean, when you just said that, that certainly resonated. I'm sure that was part of it. Trying to figure out what was going on, trying to see if I could control what was going on. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I mean, six years old. You you know, we we have we only have a certain level of understanding about anything. So, right, right. Um, I just I just think that it's so interesting that. Um, that's kind of the, the pathway you, you chose right. to figure things out. Right. I was also situated, I read about this in the book, I was also situated in my parents' bedroom for like three months because I had um, penicillin resistant strep throat and I wasn't getting over it and I didn't go to school and I was like, you know, at the doctor all the time uh, until, you know, I could get rid of the strep throat. So, you know, there you know, the temptations were there, their bedroom, I was, I was, you know, watching TV in their bedroom. And, mm -hmm. you know, there was everything at, you know, literally at my feet, for me to investigate, you know, their, their dresser drawers, my mother's closet, which was, you know, I think I write that it always felt like eternal twilight in her closet. And she, had <laughs> some, and she was a clothes horse. Um, and I come by that naturally, too. And she loved shoes, and she loved all that stuff. And it was just, you know, it was like I was just enthralled and I loved and it was a walk in closet. So oh. I, just, I just loved like being among her things and trying on her, her things. And I remember mm. she had a gown for my uncle's wedding that was really pretty. And um, I wanted to try it on. It was like this sort of like dark fuchsia and it was uh -huh. you know, it was very good. It, it, to me, it seemed very glamorous. It had a lace overlay. And I remember trying it on with, you know, t you know, tottering on her high heels and right. my father catching me. And it was really, I thought he was going to be very angry, but it was really a lovely moment between us. And mm. he just, you know, said to me, I think you better get out of your mother's dress. <laughs> put her shoes away and he was very you know, like that's lovely he, because it could have been humiliating you know yes no he was absolutely mm. it it's it's a memory that that has stuck with me you know 
more than 50 years later. And it was really, mm. it was a very, it's a very warm memory that I have of my father, a childhood memory of my father, because as I said, he was very strict and he was very, you know, he had his rules and um, very, very yeah. strict there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, speaking of the difference of, and again, because we're talking about a book that I don't, that is fascinating and has, you know, with all this sleuthing, uh, you come to a point in the book where you, there's a big reveal. And of course, I'm not going to reveal it because mm -hmm. I want you all to buy the book. Um, and so we have to kind of dance around that. But I want to talk about a little more about, you know, again, you've mentioned that your parents are very different personalities coming from diff different cultures, both Jewish. Um, uh, what about just sort of this idea of language and, and expression? I mean, there's this whole aspect of this book where you, again, when I was talking to you the other day, there's all these pushes and pulls and, and contrasts and opposition. So you were sort of brought up in a, I mean, not terribly religious Jewish household, but then you went to sort of an Orthodox Jewish school, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Up to what age? Up to what age? Um, I went, well, I'm just going to backtrack for a moment, if, if that's okay. Um, my yeah, mother was brought up Sephardic, very traditional. Yeah. Um, and, and explain you know, what that means, because a lot of people won't know what she, that means. She is, um, she is a Jew who traces her, um, her roots back to, uh, 15th, 14th, 15th century Spain. Okay. Um, she, my grandparents were born respectively, my grandmother in Greece, my grandfather in Turkey, but they spoke a language since you were, since you brought up languages called Ladino. And Ladino was, or is a 15th century Spanish that's laced with Hebrew words. Um, the Moors were there at the time. The Moors and Jews were, were neighbors, were very convivial neighbors. And there's Arabic words that also, there was some Portuguese. So it's, it's Ladino is primarily this kind of, um, I guess you could compare it to like Shakespearean English, but in Spanish version. But it, ha it also has a number of other influences from other languages. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think I write in the book that they carried this language like baggage. I mean, they did not let go of this language. Both my grandparents spoke it fluently. Um, and mm. when it was time for them to leave Greece and Turkey for various reasons that I go into the book, they left as teenagers and met in Cuba. They were thrilled to go to Cuba. And um, some of the family went to Palestine, but m m many of them went to Cuba because they already had Ladino and it was easy for them to adapt to learning that to learning modern Spanish. So hmm. that was that was one of the things, but there was a big divide between my. Do you still speak it? Excuse me. Do you, do you still speak it now? I don't speak Ladino. Um, my mother does, um, uh -huh. uh, but her memory, unfortunately, is failing. But she she speaks it well. My aunt does, whose memory is not failing, and she's a native Ladino speaker. Hmm. I've always sort of had this fantasy that I would like take two months and immerse myself in it and learn it. Because when I read it, I can sort of figure it out from the spelling, mm. but it's different spellings. And but it does mm. use it does use the Roman alphabet. It's, it's not like Yiddish, which uses Hebrew letters. So um, yeah, it was you know. And my mother was a masterful linguist. She taught herself Portuguese. Mm. She you know she took French lessons, and she for a while she 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 was a pretty good French speaker. I mean, she really had you know the vocabulary down. So language is very, very important. And I will say that with all the complexities and difficulties that I've had with my mother, um, I, I, I thank her for giving me the gift of a second language, um, mm. growing up with a second language, growing up with, with you know, such a rich culture. Um, she was not necessarily, well, she was superstitious. In your case, Spanish, meaning when you yes, say a second, yes, second language, Spanish. Yes, Spanish. She was not mm -hmm. religious, but she was, well, she was kind of, I mean, she sort of like believe in, you know, believed in a God that sat like on a throne and looked over you. Um, very traditional. Um, we did have a kosher home. Oh, you uh, did? Okay. We did. we did. She was, she was, she actually went to a Jewish, a Zionist Jewish day school in Havana. So she, and she could read Hebrew. My father, on the other hand, was brought up classically reform. Mm -hmm. Didn't know any Hebrew, nothing. Um, and was highly assimilated. 
Hmm. So that was a, that was also a divide, and it was a source of tension. And um, what did you think about that as a child? I mean, did you feel like you had to pick sides, or you know, were you trying to do both? Just curious to know emotionally how you negotiated that. Um, um, emotionally, I was team mom when I was a, a little kid. Hmm. Um, for various reasons, for various in the various domestic dramas that those two cooked up, but um, I would say that in my late teens, early twenties, I really began to appreciate my father. Mm. And, you know, I um, I was kind of team dad. You know, um, if you bear with me with this um, metaphor, I want to use um, one of my father's heroes was Winston Churchill. Loved Winston Churchill. Um, and when I was in England several years ago, I went to all the Winston Churchill kind of museums and, you know, sites and everything. And one of the things I read was he had an American mother and a British father. But he said, even though he was half American, he always felt completely British. Hmm. For me, that changed. That, 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 that wavered. Sometimes I felt completely Latinx and sometimes I felt completely Team Harold. You know? Oh, I see. That's different. Yeah, yeah, different experience. It's different, it's different than a lot of people might have, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what that feels like to to make to switch like that, to have an identity switch like that. Um, I don't know if that's something you can describe. I think it was. I think it was more of an emotional switching than preferring one culture over the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just sort of relating to how uh, a culture expressed itself, or or was more commonly, you know, expressions because of a culture or well, way of being or? Yeah, but also, I mean, the Jewish, the, we did Jewish only with my mother's family. My father's family did not do Jewish. And <laughs> Quotes, you know, unquote, did Jewish, right, yeah. <laughs> right, right, They did the, you know, all the holidays were with them. All the observances were with them. They changed plates um, on Passover as my mother did. Um, okay. And, and so like our our Passover seders were, you know, a real cultural stew, a real mix of traditions. And, you know, my grandfather every year would say, El ano que viene, Havana, you know, next year we'll all be in Havana. You know, that, oh, was, his, okay. that, was, his, that was his Jerusalem, you know, okay. that was, that was yeah. you, know, the, you know, because Havana for all of my life was on lockdown. We yeah. couldn't go there. It was like- well, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say that I lived in Miami for about five years, um, mm -hmm. which of course was was full of. And I guess you were on Coyote for a while. You were you lived mm -hmm. in Miami for a while, so um, I just and I was in my um, I was a, a young uh, yeah in my 30s, I guess early 30s. So different. I wasn't a child, but um, the obsession of all the Cubans there. They just they'd all left Cuba, but there was just an obsession about Cuba and, you know, any place where it was once home that you can't return to, I mean, has to be incredibly painful, um, you know, and unresolved, you know, so. And, um, and, and that Cuban story, you know, dovetails with Jews who constantly have been in exile. Yeah. So um, in some ways, the, the Cubans, the Cubans have learned from the Jews how to do exile. You know, they, mm. they've, they've observed that, and there are there. I, I think there are some striking, um, striking um, similarities. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, and you so, know, and, and you know, the Cuban American lobby is still very, uh, very strong, very, mm -hmm. very, you know, anti having anything to do with Cuba, and that's that's really just that's really a separate discussion that I'm. Yeah. You know. I'm not to well, returning that. to, I want to return to the book a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. This is all about the book, all this kind of, you know, these, these currents are, are driving the story in the book. Um, but I, I thought maybe it'd be nice if you did a, just read a little bit from it. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking a little bit about the, you know, I mean, there's, there are a couple of key moments. I mean, there's you as the child discovering Judy, but <clears throat> excuse me. There's also, of course, the letter, and I don't know if you had something else in mind that you wanted to read. Yeah, I could read the letter, the the prologue, because that's pretty dramatic. I I had I had a set aside of a couple of sections about the origin of asylum, of the of the title, why the book okay. is asylum. 
So I'm going to let you pick, Jessica. Well, you know what? I think let's talk about, do that with the letter and let's talk about asylum. We, we, we can talk about that. Okay. Let's do it. And that's easy to find because that's just in the prologue. The prologue okay. is called, I'll just read uh, like for a, a couple of minutes. Okay. The prologue is called Burn This. There is a Jewish saying that an uninterpreted dream is like an unopened letter from God, a letter that surely must contain secrets of the universe. The only letters I received that muggy summer when I stayed on the non-air conditioned side of the 92nd Street Y were from, my fa were from my father, usually cheery cards, well hello over there, or thin sheets of yellow legal sized paper with bits of curmudgeonly wisdom designed to steer my focus away from my recent heartbreak. You're a smart kid, you can do this, you can finish that darn thesis. Don't let all that time and money be for naught. This time was different. In my mail was an unusually thick envelope that bore the return address of my father's Hartford office. I knew he had more on his mind than usual that summer, and the heavily taped envelope with too much postage signaled as much. It came on the heels of another letter he had sent, his more typical one-page kind telling me, I shall no longer pay the reservation fee at your school. During the summer of 1985, I commuted on the Madison Avenue bus to the computer lab at Columbia, where I struggled to finish a collection of short stories for my MFA. It was also the summer my heart shattered into a million jagged pieces when my boyfriend vanished, as if our eight years together had never happened. My mm. loneliness, or as my father put it, lonesomeness, not only saddened him, it magnified his own feeling of aloneness in the world. My father was not one for phone calls. After the initial how are yous, he was all breathing in silence, so he had taken to writing me a couple of times a week. His postscript was always the, the same. Write to me at the office. I don't want your mother to know that we're corresponding. We both knew my mother would be wildly suspicious were she not included in our correspondence. While my father was a reluctant talker under the best of circumstances, he was a formal old-fashioned writer. He used words like chant and cheers and salutation. He always signed his cards and notes to me, your father. Love was not in his vocabulary. Did he love me? I knew he worried about me. I was the sensitive firstborn daughter who was the frequent target of her mother's hair trigger moods. His worry was love, but I sensed the latest correspondence, ma massive as it was, would reflect that he was older, more tired, and showing more overt signs of his Parkinson's disease. He had already grumbled that my mother was getting more difficult to tolerate, finally de defeating him with her relative youth. She was 17 years younger. And with her epic tantrums and fiercely won economic depress, uh, independence. This time I was sure he would dispense with his bonhomie, his homespun wisdom, his greetings and salutations, and finally tell me all that I had been yearning to know since my earliest days. I carried the large envelope carefully to my room as if it were fragile. Addressed in my father's now shaky print, it felt substantial, weighty. Was it an opus of his life, a compilation of regrets, a decision to divorce my mother at last, along with a laundry list of her fa failures, her denunciations? Whatever it was, it called for a private place in which to read it. As I went up the elevator, I trembled with the recognition of yet another possibility, that it contained a suicide note. The letters of my father's handprinting, once so tall and commanding, had lately begun to droop. My father's printing had been his forte, his identity, and his imprint on the world. It announced that he was a serious, meticulous, determined man. I had always loved and saluted the stalwart letters he formed, one and the same on birthday cards, valentines, and now in the letters he sent me, in honor of the Navy man he once was. But the last time I was home, I noticed that his left arm shook, and he walked with a shuffle. Leave me alone, he muttered. I'm going to skip down to um, what I did to that letter, if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be minute. great. Um, well, what happens is um, I get a, a I get a, a voicemail from my father. Listen, my father's voice. Listen, came my father's voice, which had become low and gravelly from the Parkinson's. I sent you a letter that should have arrived today. I hope to God you're hearing this before you open it. Do not read it. In fact, I need you to burn it. His voice had the same underlying panic as when he would come home from his accountant's job and take me aside to whisper, what kind of mood is your mother in? The answer was never good. Burn it? 
but this was the letter I had been waiting for, the confession, the explanation, the spilling of all secrets that had shrouded my childhood, the key, the clue, the one final piece of the puzzle, burn it? I held my father's letter up to the fluorescent light to catch a faint glimpse of its contents. All I saw was the x-ray outline of folded, lined sheets full of scribbling, the crabbed, crowded letters, another sign of Parkinson's. And then I'll skip down. In the end, I destroyed the letter. I was sure uh, I destroyed the divine trastiendas, and I explained what trastiendas are, their secrets. I was sure that it, that was, I was sure we're in that letter. Trastiendas that had the power to crack open the sky. I dropped the burning letter, sealed and intact, into the metal garbage can and watched it disintegrate into ash. A raised bald eagle stamp remained distinct and resolute until it was finally a different, unrecognizable form of matter. Yeah, that was just a killer moment for me. I was like, no! <laughs> Don't burn that killer letter. For me too. Oh my God. And I didn't remember when you held it to the light so you saw a little bit of something, but nothing. Mm -hmm. So like, how, how many sheets of paper were in there, do you think? Let me just try to figure out something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm say, I'm 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 going with if, if memory serves you know at least four to five pages. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was a thick letter and the and it was you know the the yellow legal size paper. So. Um, wow. Gosh. Mm -hmm. And he and it was handwritten and everything. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing, really. Um, so of course we have to all read your book to find out what you find out. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to urge everyone, and then I want to skip ahead now because, again, we can't really dive into the book too much. I want everybody to read it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit just about how you stuck with everything. I mean, you said yourself you don't mind talking about the fact that you're 60 and this is your first book, finally out. Okay. I was in my 50s when my first book came out. Um, you know, how did you keep going? What kept you going? Well, you know, I like to say that it's technically my first book. It's my first okay. published. It's my first published book. No, I'm I'm kind of sort of half kidding. But that, that's um, kind of true. I mean, there's. I mean, that's good. I mean. I mean, you you get to be this age, and you have you know you have a couple of books rustling, and you know the the uh, metaphorical dress, uh, you know, desk drawer, but um. The, you know, the story always gripped me. I When I got my MFA in fiction, I was a fiction writer before I was a memoir writer. I wrote a collection of stories for my thesis called The 90 Day Wonder. And uh, The 90 Day Wonder, I later found out during research, I, I thought it was a wonderful uh, descriptor, was, um, was a, a more of a pejorative term. And it referred to young college graduates who were trained literally in in 90 days to become uh, officers in the second world war over men who had socks older than them so mm. they, were, they were they were resented and you know it was it was it was a bit of a tough um tough social interaction but um so you know i as i was over the years as i was working on the book i went back to my thesis and i read the title it's called the 90 day wonder i read the title story and there I found the first stirrings of asylum. Okay, because that's a good look. I wanted to loop back to asylum and talk mm -hmm. about the title and maybe you can tell listeners some, some basics about that. Yeah, so what I just want to say is that the story was always with me. It always gripped me. My father's, you know, mysterious past always gripped me. Okay. The, the title asylum, well, I actually grew up at 1735 Asylum Avenue in West Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, for people who are the Bostonians who are listening, if you are traveling to New York, um, you will see a big sign on I-84 for exit 48 Asylum Street. Mm. Three miles up that road, I lived on Asylum Avenue in the suburb of West Hartford. So um, there was that, there was, there was that meaning, um, you know, and, and the book cover has, has a picture of my house in the background, 1735 Asylum. There was also the asylum that my mother's family, my mother immigrated to the United States in 1958, but um, the rest of the family were, came in under refugee status um, in the early 60s from Cuba. Mm. Um, in fact, uh, they were uh, supported by HIAS, which is um, 
a Jewish, uh, it was highest stands for Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, but it's much more than that. It helped Jews who were, you know, in peril um, leave their, you know, their home countries if they had to. So they were, they were assisted by Hyas. And so they literally sought asylum, uh, you know, when they came here. And, you know, the, the third meaning is a little more tongue in cheek. Um, you know, it was a dysfunctional household. It was, for lack of a better term, it was a crazy household. And it, it truly was an asylum sometimes. So I, it has, you know, all those layers, you know, play into into the title. And, you know, hopefully I've done that in the story as well. Mm -hmm. um, was, yeah, it's funny. I had a childhood friend. I think she lived on that street. It was a oh, camp really? friend. It was a camp friend. And I mm -hmm. stayed at her house. Do they have some big brick houses on that, on that mm -hmm. street? Mm -hmm. She lived in a big brick house, I remember. Um, so I was familiar with the name of that street, which is kind of another funny uh, connection that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, I want to, you know, just looking at the time, um, want to talk a little bit more about your, your creative process. Oh, okay. um, and, and I want to talk a little bit too about the, the Kaddish that run, is a theme that runs through the book as well. This is the right. prayer. Um, if we have time to sort of touch on that, I'm just interested to talk a little bit more about that. So, um, so when you said the story gripped you and obviously you were writing fiction and then you made this decision to do a memoir, I mean, that's kind of a big leap. Um, I'm just wondering what made you make that decision mm -hmm. and how you got started. I was not a natural fiction writer. Okay. Um, and I even knew that as I was getting my, my, my MFA, but you know, I had to finish because I put all this time into it. But I was not a natural fiction writer. My voice wasn't suited to it, or at least I felt it wasn't. So in my early 30s, I started writing essays about personal essays. And I really, I really felt that that was where my voice was and that mm, was where okay. my heart was. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that was, that was sort of the leap, the transition um, in my, in my 30s. Um, as far as my process, I want I want to like talk directly to the women making art who may be listening or make your art. There's no expiration date on it. That's nice. Mm -hmm. keep, keep dreaming because those dreams fuel your art. And one of the most revelatory things that helped me get through this book was um, I discovered, you know, later in the process, the notes app. I'm not a techie person at all, but I discovered the notes app on my phone game changer for me. Because mm. even if you're taking notes and you're not sitting in front of the blank screen, you know, typing eight hours a day, just taking notes, you're making art. Thinking about it, you're making art. Don't undercut yourself if you feel like, oh, I'm not doing anything. I'm not, you know, I'm not producing a thousand words a day. That's, that's not what it's about. It's, it's a whole holistic process. And I want to encourage women, especially, not to beat themselves up. If you are sitting in the carpool uh, line you're, and you're scribbling in your notebook or whatever or on a sticky note, you're making art. Um, yeah, that's you know, lovely. If, if you're sketching, you're making art. So, um, you know, a lot of people have asked me, well, what was your process? Do you write every day? No, I don't write every day. And my process is a little, you know, it's a little scattered because my life is because life is a little scattered. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, towards the end, when I really, you know, pushed to finish it, I was working on it every day. But by then <laughs> I had this, you know, massive structure to work with. But, mm -hmm. you know, to get to get it started took many years and many tries and many notes, you know, scattered all over the place. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just want people to to realize that there are so many different ways to make art into a Yeah, no, that, that's that's wonderfully encouraging. I, I know, um, you know, I, I try to take walks every day and I will talk, send myself um, a voicemail. Um, I'll yeah. talk into the phone when I have a thought about the novel because I do get a lot of thoughts about the characters or whatever it was I wasn't able to just sort of untie when I was sitting sitting down. There's something about my moving my body that seems to free up things and the shower but I, I will I will send myself notes in that in that, in that regard so um, I love that 
that you take, you know, take these little pieces and that you're honoring yourself enough to note that that piece of thought is, is worthy of jotting down and saving and collecting. So, um, you know, that, that's wonderful. How did you come to the, um, to the structure of your book? You know, um, Oh, structure, structure. That's the, that was, that was my challenge. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a visual person, so I think that it didn't help me. It, it sort of hindered me in a way. Um, mm. I worked with, um, a wonderful developmental editor, um, okay. Jamie Bernard, and she made me do an exercise several times over the years that I absolutely loathed, but I did it and she was right. She made me write every single scene in the book, list it. Every single Oh my scene. God. Everything. <laughs> okay. you know, and it really helped me to know my book inside mm. and out because I could move things around. I wasn't writing a chronological narrative. I was writing yeah. a thematic narrative. And mm -hmm. that exercise helped me do that. It was, it was torture. I hated it. I mean, I complained mm. every time I had to do it, but you know, like eating, you know, spinach, it was good for me. So, mm. um, so mm -hmm. I did it and, and I did it. I did it a bunch of times too. And, you know, I remember being mad, you know, Jamie's a friend. And I remember being mad at her, you know, when she made me do it for like the fifth time, but, you know. Well, this is interesting that you are, you have this thing about you that I, I, I wanted to, you know, here's an example where you took a kind of exercise and even though you maybe didn't fully understand the meaning of it or how it would be relevant or how it might help, you took the advice, let's, Today, but you tried it and you did it, and then something came about because of it. I feel like you did that with the Kaddish, that prayer mm -hmm. for your father. Mm. You know, um, if you want to just talk a little bit about what you decided to do, I, I don't think that's really giving anything away. If you do, we won't no, talk not about at it. All. But, not at okay. all. It's, it's definitely a, a major um, thread in the book. Um, and that's really insightful. I like, I like the way you put that, that, you know, I approached the Kaddish. It was, I, I decided when my- And first maybe explain to, explain to, what's to the, the listeners. Yes. Yeah. In tradition, in, in traditional uh, Judaism, the mourner's Kaddish is, is what it is. It's a prayer of mourning and Kaddish in Aramaic, which the prayer is written in, as well as Hebrew means to sanctify. So you are sanctifying the memory of your loved one. If you are going to be very traditional about it, um, your closest relations, such as your parents and, and God forbid, no, no, the son and, no, I think it's just your parents. You say the Kaddish for um, 11 months. And, you know, my father died. Every day, every, every day. Every day. I mean, right. there, there are some um, people that go to all three prayer services morning noon and, and night wow okay mm -hmm. that i knew i couldn't do i had two small children but um and i didn't i didn't set out to do it um for more than 30 days at first because i found it very daunting i had little kids and my husband was traveling all the time i didn't i didn't know what I, how i was gonna do this but um you know 30 days turned into 60 days and then before i knew it it was thanksgiving and I had been going every day and there were sometimes glitches where, you know, I didn't have someone to watch the kids or, um, you know, and I brought them with me. Um, my son was five at the time. He's 24 now. So it just gives you an idea of how long ago it was, you know, and he, you know, he would go like in his Scooby-Doo slippers sometimes. And that's just the way it was. Um, and so is this always around the same time of, of day or that you went? It evolved, your... it evolved as, as, as the sun, as the sun set at different times, okay. um, I would go to, um, some Orthodox gatherings, some Orthodox prayer services, because they said the Kaddish during the afternoon service, like around three thirty, four 4 o'clock. And that okay. was really good for me because then I could, Very practical. Kids, then yeah. then I could pick up my kids after school. Yeah. Um, I could put them in after school. Um, program, wow. and then I could pick them up. So I had, I had like my ways to do it. And when, wow. you know, when we even traveled, my, my husband and I went to, um, to Italy that year to Rome, I went to the great synagogue. And um, that was sort of a funny story because, um, you know, the synagogue was basically very secured. I mean, there were, there were, there were 
police with, um, you know, soldiers with guns. I mean, it, it was just a very kind of lockdown situation. So you had to kind of report to a security booth. Mm. And, um, you know, the, the, the security guard was a little suspicious, like, why do you want to go into the synagogue? And I said, well, I want to go. And I tried to, in my broken Italian, explain and then kind of fell into Spanish with him. Um, I said, I'm, I'm in mourning for my father this year and I want to say the Kaddish. He looked at me and he said, Americana, because, you know, tradition, it, traditionally in, in, um, in that synagogue, which was high Orthodox, women weren't saying the Kaddish. Mm. Women saying the Kaddish is like a relatively, you know, in the history of Judaism, a relatively recent thing. It's maybe mm. 60 years old, at the most mm. 70 years old. Um, you know, for women to do that. And I just thought it was so funny that he thought I was like this, you know, American interloper. But, you know, we went to the synagogue and we did it. You know, I did it. My husband did it on his side. There was a divider kind of pot, a, a row of potted plants that divided the men from the women. How long does that prayer take? What What's the length of that prayer? The Kaddish is about five paragraphs. And it's, okay. it's, it's always embedded in a prayer service. And the shortest prayer service uh, of the day is the evening service. Okay. So that's why I chose the evening service because I, I, you know, I had to get kids off to school. Two kids. <laughs> yeah. Two kids, yep. Two kids off to school in the morning. And it just, it, it just worked for me time wise and, and, um, you know, schedule wise. Mm -hmm. So there was this process that happened to you of saying this five paragraph prayer in Hebrew, um, that you, came to sort of memorize over time? I mean, it's was it almost- Ara It's really interesting. It's an Aramaic. Um, it's okay. technically not in Hebrew, but it, you know- Oh, know okay. It's not in Hebrew, but it's, it's you know, it's it's similar to Hebrew. Um, I think Jesus spoke Aramaic, if I'm if I'm correct. Like it's a really ancient language and it mm. is related to Hebrew. Um, mm. It was really hard for me at first because my Hebrew was like rusty, rusty, rusty. I mean, it was just, you know, it, it was, you could hear it squeaking. I mean, I just, I could not, it was, and the, and the words of, of the Kaddish, it, it's, they're very chewy. They're very multisyllabic. They're very, you know, but mm. um, I had a friend who actually lost her dad around the same time and she was very helpful with um, getting, you know, helping me to say the Kaddish and also, you know, the choreography of the prayer service, when to bow, when to move, when to step back. Oh my um, goodness, it really is like a dance. It was like- It's almost dance. like a musical dance of some sort. Yeah. there's. I'm the fascinated because I, I really, I, it's not my experience. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. Jewish, but I haven't experienced it in that way. Um, so it's, it's just to hear it sort of from the outside when you're talking mm -hmm. about five paragraphs and this ancient language and there's when to bow and time of day. I mean, it really is. A, it's almost like this little mini play. Yeah, there's a lot of pageantry to it, too. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's, mm -hmm. very, it's, you know, Jewish prayer services are very decorous. There's points where you bow, points where you sit, points where you, you know, face, you know, you know, do a certain kind of way of bowing. I mean, there's so there's a lot of pageantry to it. So. Um, yeah, I learned it and I did, you know, saying it every day. I, it, you know, one day I just sort of realized, well, I don't have to look down at the pages. I don't need a cheat sheet or anything. I, I did oh, that wow. with my heart. I yeah. With my heart. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is going to sound funny too, but it's, it's making me think of like, you know, people who go to yoga every day or, you know, that goes through certain moves or, you know, certain habits that people have in mm -hmm. their life. I mean, whether it's taking your your walk before dinner or your walk after dinner or um, getting up in the morning and having your coffee and having the certain cup and putting it at the table and sitting in your certain chair. I don't know. I, I just think it's it's kind of fascinating to think about it. It, it is very um, structured and it is very routinized. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's part of the part of the goal. But it kind of positions you like, like all things like this, rituals, habits or whatever, mm -hmm. touch points kind of, uh, get your get your body, your mind, your, your heart sort of positioned after over time, um, and sort of more. It's um, it's sort of like it opens the doors faster, maybe to some other place that maybe you were trying to go or reach for. I don't know. Right. And, right. and also the Kaddish was very much a post. Uh, was time I set aside to talk to my father. It was mm. a posthumous conversation with him, mm. and it became even more so over time. 
And that mm. was very intentional on my part. I really wanted to embrace him um, and make up in some way for the time I had lost with him. I felt cheated that I mm. didn't get to know him well enough until my early 20s. And, you know, and I missed him. And I want, you know, he had been ill and he wasn't himself for the last few years of his life. And I missed him. And I, I wanted to recoup some of that. And so... Wow. I kind of sort of felt like having a posthumous conversation with him as well. Boy, that's powerful and beautiful, which I really appreciate your sharing here. Um, I'm wondering if um, anyone would like to ask a question. Um, I see things in the chat. I don't know if... Are you I don't know if there are uh, questions. Um, so I don't know if anyone would like to ask a question or we can just keep talking. I don't... I know we've had technical difficulties, so I don't think our Belmont host is able to. Oh, here's our Belmont. Oh, she is. Oh, here you are. But we can't oh. hear you. You have to. We can't you. hear you. <laughs> Isn't that like Time Magazine's word of the year or something? Unmute yourself. Unmute. Unmute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I've um I've been listening this whole time. I just didn't want to interrupt. Um, I'd like to thank you both so much for your patience and all of the attendees. I really appreciate that citing technical difficulties. Um, Jessica, I thought you asked some very intriguing and well thought out questions that provided a lot of insight. And Judy, I'm absolutely fascinated by your story. And I think that your cultural background makes for something very unique that many can learn from and has definitely inspired a lot of your readers to learn about their own family histories. So mm. I'd like to thank you very much both um, for joining us today. and participating and yeah we'd, I'd like to open up the time to any questions that anybody might have yeah I really I, I think that's so true Judy about um I think your book really does stir up the, the whole sense of generational inheritance mm -hmm. um which readers will discover when they read your book um I think you know I've certainly walked away thinking a lot about who came before me and what their lives were and you really uh, your digging brings so much of that to life in a powerful way. And we all are carriers of many generations. We just may or may not be aware of it. So right. I really um, love that about your book. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much, Jessica. And I've loved everything you've asked me. It's really, it's really made me feel... Um, it's really giving me a lot to think about because every time I, I talk about the book and think about the book, I, I discover, more, I, I just, you know, keep discovering more things about my story and more things about myself. So it's always, you know, it's never, um, you know, it's never a repetitive thing for me. It's always fresh and it's always, and, and your questions were certainly, you know, insightful and just, you know, really, really spot on. So thank you so much. Well, there are other things, you're welcome. There are other things in the book too that just resonated so much with my own personal history. And my, my, I had a grandfather who actually has a Turkey um, passport. Oh, um, wow. is, he so, is he Sephardic? No, I don't think, no, I don't think so. So of course I'm wondering how we're related and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I think we're coming to the end of our time. I don't know if there's a question or not or... Um, I'm not seeing any questions unless anybody has any last minute thoughts. However, okay. um, I have just sent the link to um, both the Belmont Books event page to sign up for any future events, as well as the link specifically to this event where you can purchase both Judy and Jessica's uh, books, which we thank you so much for supporting your local bookstores and we hope you continue to do so. Um, FYI, with the paper shortage at the moment, uh, order your books for both yourself or for your loved ones this holiday season in advance as they may be delayed um, in shipping. So, especially. Boy, that's incredible. <laughs> so, order now. Boy. Yeah, yep. order now. <laughs> Plan ahead, as they say. But um, I just want to, um, in addition to thanking Jessica, I want to thank Kathy Crowley at Belmont Books for, um, for, for hosting us and to you, Kira, also. Thank you, Kira. Yeah, of course. Um, Thank you, so I, I just want to give a shout out to Belmont Books and, and you know. Beautiful Belmont, Belmont Books. Beautiful Belmont Books. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. It was lovely to meet you. A good evening, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye.